Hello, welcome. The Fulbright Association is pleased to welcome all our attendees today to today's webinar, Applying to Graduate Programs in Education, Making Your Application Stand Out, presented by the Harvard Graduate School of Education. The Fulbright Association extends the Fulbright International Exchange into a lifelong experience for full U.S. alumni. We connect alumni and friends of the Fulbright program through lifelong learning, collaborative networking, and service projects at home and abroad. Through our 57 local chapters, the Fulbright Association hosts more than 230 regional and national programs each year for visiting Fulbrighters and alumni throughout the U.S. I will now turn it over to Stan, who will be leading the presentation today. Hi, everybody. My name is Stanislav Rifkin. I am an Associate Director of Admissions at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Um, thank you for being with us tonight, or uh, whatever the time may be, wherever you may be um, around the world today. Um, I am especially thankful to the Fulbright Association for working with us um, in partnership um, on this event um, and uh, in, in general uh, on, on various other um, initiatives. We'll uh, mention some of our uh, various partnership benefits for Fulbright alumni um, a little bit later on uh, in the session. Um, but today's uh, seminar is going to be called Demystifying the Graduate School Application. Um, and we do hope that uh, you come away today with some um, more comfort, uh, with uh, you know, a strategy for applying to graduate programs within education, um, and really an idea of um, some of the ways you can better uh, prepare yourself and the way you can put your best foot forward uh, in the application process, not just for HGSC, uh, if you're thinking about applying here, but um, to other uh, comparable uh, education schools as well. Uh, I'd like to welcome some of the panelists that are going to um, be uh, presenting here with us today. Um, so first of all, uh, I'll start with Jackie Spencer, um, and then we'll uh, move on to our uh, student panelists. Hi, everyone. My name is Jackie Spencer. I am an assistant director of admissions here uh, in the admissions office at HGSC. Um, and I'll be in the Q&A um, answering questions throughout the presentation. Hi, Eliza. Hi, everybody. I'm Eliza. Um, I go by she, her, hers. I am doing the education policy and analysis program here at HESC, and I had a full right to South Korea, um, part of the ETA program um, back in 2013 to 2015. Thank you. And uh, Jane, would you like to finish us off? Sure. Hi, I'm Jane. I use she, her pronouns, and I was an ETA in Kosovo uh, during the 2019-2020 school year, and I'm currently in the EDM program, um, and like specifically within the human development and education program. Awesome. Thank you all. So uh, Jackie is going to uh, be working in the chat um, throughout uh, the session. So if you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A. Um, function of the webinar, and uh, we will try to uh, answer uh, as many as we can. Of course, there might be some questions um, that we'll get to just naturally through the course of our presentation, um, and so we we might wait to address some until later, um, and then we'll have uh, a set of um, questions and, and conversation uh, with Eliza and Jane uh, a little bit later on um, in our uh, in our presentation. So our goals for today is uh, to learn strategies and best practices for researching and defining fit, evaluating fit, and then demonstrating and articulating fit. And so um, the word fit is going to come up a lot, um, but we really think that um, it is uh, essential to being um, able to understand whether a program is uh, really right for you and then being able to craft um, materials that present the most compelling case uh, for your admission. I'm going to be going um, a little bit fast today, um, and that's for a few reasons. One, um, a lot of what I've discussed uh, and a lot of the materials that that I'll mention 
um, are um, already um, hopefully in, in your hands or at least digitally. Um, I sent an email before this meeting, um, a few hours before and uh, with a set of links. So folks should be able to access a lot of the information that I'm going to talk about today. Um, we'll also give you uh, this slide deck um, in the coming days as well to all anyone who's attended the um, event. Uh, we'll we'll go ahead and, um, and and email that to you. So if you're not catching all the information as we're going uh, rather quickly, don't worry about it. Uh, we'll we'll make sure that um, you get it. But today we're going to really uh, root our conversation in two foundational questions. So how is fit defined for a particular program that you are applying to? And then how can your application demonstrate this fit and its associated qualities? And so defining fit, uh, there's a few uh, threshold considerations that are probably you know, the most obvious components uh, of, of uh, understanding whether you're, you're eligible to apply to a program. Um, some programs have uh, very concrete prerequisites, right? So uh, whether that's a particular academic background that you needed to uh, complete um, an occupational setting that you needed to have come from um, a certain number of years of experience that you needed to have attained. Uh, perhaps some programs have minimum scores or, or GPA requirements. Um, and then, of course, there's additional threshold considerations to consider, uh, such as, you know, do you have time to complete the materials that you need to complete um, in time for the particular application uh, deadline? Do you have um, you know, the, the required number of references who you feel comfortable asking, who would be able to write a strong letter of recommendation on your behalf and allow you to submit uh, the recommendation. And then, of course, for a lot of folks, uh, a significant consideration, uh, a threshold consideration really is, is funding. Um, so do, uh, will you be able to afford uh, this particular uh, course of study. So those are sort of the basic and obvious ones that uh, uh, sort of occur to, I think, um, most folks as they read the websites and, and understand if they're, if they're eligible. But there's a whole range of additional criteria that um, I hope you will uh, consider if you have not already. Um, and we'll talk about that today throughout the session. So um, uh, this question of what will admissions evaluate um, it's something that can be addressed um, through a, a range of resource, uh, research for the vast majority of the programs that um, you might be applying to. And so you need to ask yourself, what is valued within the admissions process? So at HGSC, just for example, um, we assess uh, the following, and this is just a sampling of what we assess, and this is all publicly available information, right? So if you read our website really closely, um, if you read the materials that uh, I sent you in the email and, and uh, you receive links to, um, if you watch our information sessions and you attend our events, this is all information that um, you, will, you will hear us discuss. But those assets that we uh, hope to that we hope folks will bring to their application include a commitment to positive impact in the field of education, um, and that could look different for for different uh, people. There are some folks who are transitioning from other careers into education, uh, but they still have shown a desire to uh, improve education in some way, or they've been able to articulate that, at least in their statement of purpose and perhaps in their letters of recommendation. Uh, so even if they're coming from a different direction, we know that their intention really is to make an impact in this space. Then there's relevant preparation, and this is going to look different for every, every program, even within HGSC, what constitutes relevant preparation. But um, there's a certain baseline level of academic ability that is usually assessed. We need to be able to ensure that you're not only going to uh, be able to complete the coursework um, in our classes, but really thrive academically while here. Uh, and then there's professional accomplishments, and I include years of work experience, uh, career advancement uh, within that. And then, of course, training skills, and if you're applying to a research-based program in particular, research experience. And so often uh, admissions, uh, admissions committees and admissions offices will be very vocal in their materials about uh, that folks need all of these things. Uh, and then there's something that most folks really don't consider very often, in my experience, which is uh, fit with the program and school mission. Uh, so every school has a mission statement. A lot of programs have mission statements. 
And this is usually not uh, simply lip service. Um, it's usually not sort of just public relations, uh, you know, ask language. Uh, it really often does frame the mindset of the admissions committee and the school. And so we'll take a look at the HGSC mission briefly a little bit later on, uh, but I encourage you wherever you're applying to really consider uh, reading that mission statement uh, because all of these assets that we're talking about right now that admissions committees will be looking for, you'll need to find a way to articulate um, your, um, your, your ability uh, to, to have them uh, by, by the time that the program begins, right? Um, and that includes sort of your mission alignment. Uh, a lot of programs will also look at what you will gain, what you can gain, what you could gain, and what you would contribute as a student to your cohort. And then finally, programs um, and, and schools want well-rounded classes. They want uh, classes that uh, will possess a range of different experiences, a range of different viewpoints, uh, so that the conversation is enriched, so that folks will learn from each other. Um, and so, so there's cross-pollination of ideas. And so having different experiences, interests, and perspectives, um, and being able to leverage those um, and in, in, into your education, that those are also things that uh, schools will, will generally look at. But then there's also a range of uh, in additional insights that uh, that folks can find when looking into a school. So um, oftentimes folks don't necessarily ask what is the orientation of a particular program with regard to research, practice, or some combination. If you're applying to a doctoral program, every doctoral program is going to sit somewhere um, unique on the spectrum with regard to how research focused it is, how practice focused it is, uh, or, or whether it's a hybrid. Um, there's also different degree pathways and licensure options uh, in every school that you're going to be applying to and in every program. Um, and for an example, at HCSC, as I'll show you in, um, in a few slides here, we only have five programs. So Eliza and Jane are, are members of, of, of two different um, EDM programs. But in addition to those five programs, we also have six concentrations. And so folks actually can create for themselves up to 30 unique pathways, right? And so every school is going to use a um, little bit of different nomenclature, right, to refer to uh, what is a program, what is a concentration. And so doing that research, you can really understand how many different pathways you can choose from and whether there's a particular pathway at a school that really uh, very specifically fits the career trajectory you'd like to pursue. Um, mission and goals. Um, as I mentioned, um, faculty that you might be able to work with if you're applying for uh, a, a research-focused program, a PhD, for instance, advisors that you might want to work for. Uh, I, sub I sent you um, a, a link to the possible advisors for our PhD program. And then coursework. A lot of course catalogs are publicly available, including Harvard's. And uh, I, I think not enough students really take advantage of that uh, to look through what courses they might be taking um, at HGSC. And of course, if you know all of this information, it's going to inform your statement of purpose significantly. You're going to be able to more clearly articulate what it is you can actually take away from the program if you have a really tangible idea of what um, kinds of lessons, what kinds of professors you might work, work with, uh, what kinds of courses you might enroll in, what kinds of resources are available, et cetera. And so to that point, um, especially in doctoral programs, there's a lot of opportunity to, um, it, to look at what the current student uh, profile it is in a particular uh, school. And uh, there's even often student directories um, that doctoral programs will post where students have to opt in to uh, have their information publicly posted, but many do. And so you can actually see where they came from occupationally, geographically, um, in terms of their lived experience, and see what um, they're pursuing and, and, where, and where they're going and understand whether um, you feel that this is a community you want to join and whether this is, uh, you know, there, there is a... Um, there's value that, that you see 
um, you know, based on the the students that are there and what they're what they're pursuing. And there's also often alumni outcomes. Uh, there's various videos, there's talks, there's panels with alumni where um, you can not only interact with alumni, oftentimes uh, in these events that admissions offices put on, including ours, but you can also watch videos, uh, you know, and and read articles discussing an, an alumni's tra trajectory, um, and therefore be able to have a better sense of uh, what your own trajectory might look like uh, through a particular school and um, and and afterwards uh, with with the degree that you attain there. So at this time, I'd like to uh, turn it to what I think is really the most valuable part of this uh, webinar here today, um, and that is hearing from um, our current students. And just before I I, I pose a few questions here to um, Jane and Eliza, um, I, I do just want to say that um, we have several dozen. Uh, Fulbright alumni attending HGSE every year, uh, especially within the EDM programs. Um, so uh, this is really not a, a very unusual route. Um, a lot of folks, um, you know, at some point, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the year after, sometimes, you know, a decade later, uh, do pursue an EDM after completing the Fulbright. Um, and we're just really grateful to have Eliza and Jane here to share about their experiences um, and their trajectories. Um, so, you know, my first question is sort of the most uh, basic one. Why did you decide to pursue um, a master's degree um, at HDSC? Um, what were you both aiming to study uh, or impact? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, so for me, I, like I said, I did the Fulbright um, in 2013 to 15. And after that, I went to um, work in public schools in the U S and I did teach for America and I spent a lot of time teaching. Um, so I wanted to transition into a policy career and I knew I wanted to make a difference in the world of policy. So I mostly applied to public policy and public administration programs. Um, but I also knew that I wanted to work like specifically in education policy. And that's what drew me to this program. It's the education policy program at HGSE. Um, so this program combined my interest in working in the public policy sector with my background in education and my interest in furthering change in the world of policy. Okay. Um... So I'm a bit different from Eliza. Um, this was a career change for me. I am a licensed social worker. Um, I earned my master's degree in social work prior to completing my Fulbright grant in Kosovo. Um, but I became interested in education when I was working as a social worker with incarcerated men at Rikers Island Correctional Facility in New York. Um, most of the men had complex legal cases, past convictions, severe mental illnesses, and many of them wanted to improve their lives post-incarceration, but support in the jail and in the greater community just wasn't accessible and um, didn't address their unique needs. So I really, I wanted to, I was frustrated by the limitations and I wanted to understand how to improve educational programming for that population. So I, I applied to HUGSE, HGSE, because I believe that social work and education are complementary, And I was interested in learning about adult education needs and the theories that inform direct practice work. Um, and so after graduation, I'm actually hoping to continue working with justice involved people, um, either within a facility again or in the community for nonprofit. Um, and just helping them access better resources and have better reintegration outcomes. Awesome. Um, yeah, thank you both for, for sharing. Did, so can, can y'all tell us just a little bit about um, what what role, um, like you see Fulbright, we're, we're really grateful to have uh, an audience of all Fulbright alumni here today. Um, like yourself. So um, what what role do you see sort of Fulbright having played, a, 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 if any, in sort of your, your trajectory in like getting you to this point um, and especially like thinking about education? 
Yeah. So Fulbright um, really showed me the way that like education policy can be very different outside of the U.S. Um, so it furthered my interest in like learning from other countries. Um, and I think the Fulbright also gave me like perspectives on the role of government and policy in addressing inequality in education. So with where I went, South Korea, we they have a totally different way of looking at inequality and for working on equality in education. That's like very different from how most countries view it. Um, and so I really want, I really think that helped me lean into like my interest in kind of furthering and improving education in the U.S. So I chose like this program because I want to learn how like international policies, maybe not just South Korea, of course, but many other countries, like how these policies can be translated into the domestic context um, that we really like have to look at other countries for smart policy solutions and ideas. And just adding to that, um, I feel like my time as a full writer helped me become more comfortable working with people from different cultures and backgrounds um, so that I was able to, to just become a more empathetic and culturally responsive social worker and future educator and just general human being. And I think it gave me confidence in handling unfamiliar situations bridging those cultural gaps and just responding to crises um, since I was in a cohort that was affected by the pandemic. And, um, but I, I do feel like these skills have benefited me um, outside of my like six, seven, nine months in Kosovo. And um, I am seeing them come through in my classroom experience this fall. Awesome. Well, so when you were applying to programs, um, and there's obviously many education programs out there, uh, what what were you considering? I mean, what were you weighing uh, as you chose um, where to apply, and ultimately um, when you decided to attend HGSC in, in particular? Yeah, so like I said, I really mostly applied to public policy programs because I'm very interested in policy. Um, so a lot of the, every other program that I applied to was like mostly public administration, public policy, and those are two years. So one of the things I considered when I chose HCSE was the length of time um, that this program would take. Um, I also applied to another education school and what I looked at in deciding between HSC and the other program was the alignment between this program on policy um, and the other programs didn't seem like they were nearly as aligned with my interests. Um, and I also explored the course catalog, um, which I definitely took advantage of when applying. Um, and I looked at the courses that were offered at all the schools I applied to. And I looked at like, could I find enough classes that I wanted to take or would it be mostly classes I was just like forced to take and I wasn't very interested in? Um, and HGSE had a lot of classes that were right up my alley um, and seemed like I would not only find enough classes, but I would have like too many classes to choose from. I totally agree with Eliza. The one year program was really appealing to me and it just felt more accessible and like I wasn't taking too big of a step away from the workforce. Um, but still like it's a full one year program. So you definitely get um, a comprehensive education and just like experience with other classmates. And um, additionally, I liked how there are ways to customize the program. So I was able to choose to apply to the human development and education program um, I decided against a concentration, but I do believe that's a huge benefit of the program because it just, you're able to make like a 600 plus person program into a more intimate experience when you want it to be. Um, and I also, I just appreciate being able to take classes at other Harvard schools um, and in the greater Boston area, just because it's nice to have that option. It's um, it's kind of like a why not while I'm here type of thing. 
Awesome. Uh, well, thank you both for that insight. We'll come back to you, uh, talk about your application strategies um, in a, a little bit more detail um, later on in the, in the presentation. Um, but I'd like to talk a little bit about evaluating fit. So we talked about just the, the general considerations that we hope, um, or that we encourage folks to um, uh, take into account. Uh, when researching programs and when uh, beginning to understand what sort of assets that they'll need to demonstrate and put forth within within their application to um, uh, improve their chances of, uh, of of admission. And so now I'll just go ahead and talk a little bit about um, if you were to do this research uh, with regard to HGSCs, sort of what, what you'll find. And of course, a lot of these materials you already have. I, I sent you them before our meeting. So I am going to go through them um, a little, a little quickly, but just point out um, a, a few key um, areas that uh, that I think deserve your particular attention. So um, we do have uh, our master's uh, in education program, our our EDM. Um, of course, both Eliza and Jane are current students in um, in that degree. Uh, we have five different uh, programs uh, for our residential EDM and one online program. And we'll break that down in, in just a, a few slides here. But our EDM in general is designed for folks to get a theoretical foundation of the field of education um, and also obtain some specific skills so that while they are, they are able to deal with uh, a really a variety of issues within education, uh, wherever their career should take them, uh, they also have really key skills that they can apply in various settings. It's interesting, Eliza, that you, know, you mentioned you apply to um, you know, master's of public administration, master's of public policy programs, uh, because you know a lot of folks, for instance, after our EPA program, our uh, our policy evaluation program will go into just general policy evaluation, and that's because uh, the skills that are taught in that program, um, you know, the quantitative skills, uh, the skills regarding uh, policy and, and government, um, and and being able to um, you know assess and and, and synthesize um, uh, various regulations. Um, and, and understand uh, how to measure outcomes, uh, those are really generalizable skills. And I think you can say that about um, each of our EDM programs. Uh, we certainly hope that they're transferable throughout the field of education. Um, so we have folks coming in mid-career sometimes. We have folks who have been educators for uh, quite some time or have been in education, education adjacent spaces. Um, and we'll take a look at and discuss um, some of those uh, perspectives um, uh, now when, when talking about the program. So um, five programs. Uh, the first that we'll talk about is the Education Leadership Organizations and Entrepreneurship Program. And um, as the name implies, um, it is a big tent. Um, but generally speaking, this is a master's program that folks join when they are looking to take leadership roles in education adjacent organizations. So there is a principal licensure track there for folks with a teaching license and at least four years of experience teaching. Um, so a lot of folks take advantage of the school leadership and principal licensure track. However, um, there are a lot of folks who are looking to manage, um, for instance, nonprofits or foundations um, that work uh, in education, uh, folks that are interested in working in leadership positions in like ed tech firms, um, and so there's really a broad array of roles that people can take on after um, this education leadership program. Um, the education policy and analysis program is, uh, of course, Eliza's. Uh, and again, it's to develop the skills and practices um, to be able to effectively evaluate um, and uh, improve um, policy outcomes. And uh, folks um, sometimes focus on the very local level, some, some focus on international policy. Um, the, the area of focus is really up to uh, the particular student. The Human Development and Education Program, which Jane is in, um, is uh, really a program that uh, allows folks to focus on a particular uh, area in the human development uh, and, and learning um, life cycle and, uh, and really understand how we learn um, and how we can improve, um, you know, the um, the the, um, the how how we can improve learning at various stages of of human growth. Um, there's also a counseling licensure track 
uh, for that program um, if uh, you would like to stay for a second year. Uh, and then we have the Learning Design Innovation and Technology Program, which uh, has a few different uh, types of um, uh, folks go into it. So there are a, a lot of people coming in from uh, the tech uh, field that are interested in understanding how that can be leveraged um, to improve educational outcomes. Uh, perhaps they're interested in educational technology. Uh, we also have a lot of curriculum designers who are interested in that. We have folks who are um, looking to uh, improve um, uh, outcomes in, in places that, uh, you know, are, are struggling to uh, attract as many educators or uh, perhaps, you know, in rural areas and trying to understand how to leverage technology to be able to deliver um, uh, ed education. Uh, so a really broad range of folks uh, working in that space. And then afterwards going into everything from educational media, things like Sesame Street, Nickelodeon, uh, working for uh, a variety of, of media companies to working for Google and Apple and their educational um, divisions and and um, and um, uh, IBM uh, is has been a big recent employer um, for LDIT folks to working in school districts, uh, you know, as um, instructional um, design leads. Uh, and then finally, we have the TTL program, uh, the Teaching and Teacher Leadership Program that has two tracks. Uh, one of them develops new teachers. And uh, over the course of um, those, uh, over the course of that time in Cambridge, uh, for the licensure program, it's actually not 10 months, it's more like 12, but folks not only get an EDM degree, but they also uh, become licensed. Um, as a teacher in Massachusetts and, uh, and then a second, at the secondary level and then can get that license transferred to the other uh, 49 states. And then the other track um, in TTL is for teacher leaders. So those who would like to support uh, and coach uh, and be able to develop um, strong teachers, whether it's at the school district uh, or um, at um, you know the, the the state or national levels, uh, and so uh, that is uh, a ten month program as well. So as I mentioned earlier, in addition to each of those five programs, uh, you are uh, you are um, able to select one of six concentrations, and so it's totally optional. If instead you would prefer to take uh, a variety of elective classes a la carte in a way that you uh, feel you know, best um, honors your, your interests and, and career pursuits, you're welcome to do that. Uh, but the other option is to uh, take a concentration. And so together with the programs, again, this creates up to 30 unique paths. And so you can be in EPA and then uh, you know, education policy and analysis, and then um, also arts and learning. Um, you could be in human development and early childhood. Uh, you can be in uh, learning design, innovation, and technology, uh, but focus on identity, power, and justice within um, education and technology. So, uh, really, uh, a lot of um, uh, a lot of specificity uh, in the in the track that that you can enroll in, and that's one of the things that we're uh, we're sort of proudest of um, within our. Um, within the way that our curriculum is designed uh, in our HGSC master's programs. We also have an online uh, EDM and education leadership. Uh, this is a new program. Um, this is only its second year. It's a part-time two-year program, and it is um, meant for folks who are career embedded, who are uh, working uh, professionals within education uh, with at least seven years of experience, uh, preferably some degree of leadership interest that's been demonstrated up to this point. Um, and they're really looking to elevate their leadership uh, abilities uh, within the educational, um, within education, uh, within either the pre-K through 12 environment or in higher ed. Um, and uh, achieve uh, advancement in their career. And so um, there is a short residential component in Cambridge, just a handful of days uh, at, at the beginning of August in one's first year in the program. Um, and then after that, everything's online. Um, classes run 6 to 9 um, p.m. Um, Eastern time, uh, two days a week uh, during the regular long fall spring semesters. And the idea is that folks uh, are working with their cohorts, learning together, um, 
encountering and discussing uh, new lessons and then are able to apply them to their work um, and to their leadership in real time um, in their uh, job and then and then uh, collectively reflect on that experience um, over the course of those two years. So this program is focused on US uh, domestic, uh, on, on the domestic US education system. So uh, if you're interested in um, international education, there's a lot of opportunities for that in, in those ED, in our residential EDM programs in our PhD program, uh, but this program is really focused on um, the US. Uh, and again, there's two pathways, both pre-K through 12 and higher ed. And so I'll also talk about our doctoral programs uh, really quick. And I'll even talk about a doctoral program that we do not offer because I, I think it's important to sort of discuss the range of common degrees that you might encounter within the field of education um, as you're looking to, um, you know, perhaps uh, many of you are, are just um, uh, doing a survey at this point of, of where you might apply in the future. And so it's important, I think, to consider all of your options. But we'll talk about um, the PhD program first. So uh, much like uh, the vast majority of PhD programs that you will encounter in education, the focus here is really research and it's expanding our understanding uh, within the field of education. And so our program in particular is an inner faculty program that's actually jointly managed between the School of Education um, here at Harvard and the, Gra the Griffin Graduate School of uh, Arts and Sciences. And so what that means is that uh, you are really working with um, scholars um, across um, the Harvard University system. And it really inherently um, uh, poses education and whatever research you're doing um, as interdisciplinary, right? Um, and so there's there are three concentrations, culture, institution, and society, um, education policy and program evaluation, and then human development, learning and teaching. And between them, these are very sort of broad categories. Uh, very few folks are um, very cleanly in just one. Um, and some folks are sort of in, in between um, two in terms of their research, but they um, are you know, formally enrolled in one particular concentration. Uh, but between all these concentrations, we believe that virtually anything you wanna study within the field of education um, can be pursued um, you know, through this program. Um, and it's typically a five to seven year program. And like most PhDs, it prepares academics, researchers, policymakers, um, you know, senior advisors with regard to education policy um, and, uh, you know, future university instructors. So the other doctoral program that we offer here at HGSC is the Doctor of Education Leadership Program, the EDLD. And so the EDLD is... Um, uh, it's that's a naming convention. Uh, this is that's a degree convention that um, is unique to HGSE. Um, so you you won't necessarily see that degree listed elsewhere. Um, we'll talk about how it might um, compare to some other degrees in just a second. Um, but this is a three year uh, practice based doctorate. And uh, the goal here is to prepare graduates to lead system level transformation of the pre-K through 12 education um, system by leveraging organizational management skills, leadership strategies, um, and also a really strong understanding of politics, policy, and um, the science of learning, right? Uh, and so this program is interdisciplinary as well. It actually was co-founded by the Harvard Graduate School of Education and the Harvard Business School, right? So uh, a lot of the coursework here is very intentionally focused on leadership and organizational management and driving change in complex organizations and political environments. Um, and so the typical components in the year one, there's cohort-wide coursework. Uh, we admit about 25 folks every year, both in our PhD and in our EDLD program. And there's cohort-wide coursework. Uh, again, leadership um, is in, um, the word leadership is in the name of half the courses that you'll encounter in year one. Um, and then you have individualized electives in year two, where you can actually take classes throughout the Harvard University system. A lot of folks take classes at the Harvard Kennedy School, Harvard Business School, MIT, um, as, as um, I either Eliza or Jane mentioned you, you could uh, you know cross register um, in in quite a few uh, different classes and so um, it, the EDLD folks really pursue 
uh, their academic interests wherever they're going to lead them across the Harvard schools. And then in year three, there's actually a residency capstone. So we have uh, organizational partners around the country uh, that are working in K through 12 education in some form. Um, in some cases, they are um, they're nonprofits. Um, they might be um, uh, they might be school districts. Uh, they might be foundations. We work with. Um, uh, various uh, departments of education, both the city, state, and federal level. Uh, and so there's a lot of opportunities where to place folks, and you enact a project that's meant to achieve um, a, uh, a, a planned um, transformation uh, of some kind that improves uh, outcomes uh, within the K-12 through space during that year based on the uh, learning uh, of those first two years at HGSC. Uh, and so ideal candidates are generally emerging leaders within education. This is, uh, tends to be a mid-career program. It's folks that have a lot of uh, professional experience and also commitment to improving uh, equity. So I did want to also talk about uh, the Doctor of Education degree, the EDD, which we do not any longer offer at HDSE, but it is a common degree, and it is probably the closest analogous degree to the EDLD that I just discussed. Uh, sometimes it has a research component, but it is most often you're going to find it uh, as a practice-based doctorate, similar to the EDLD. And again, the idea here is to train aspiring leaders within education by applying least research, um, doing some um, leadership uh, and management uh, skills, uh, and then also uh, you know, developing various professional competencies uh, during one's time in the program. Um, there's the typical completion of that program. Uh, usually three is at the low end. It can go up to about seven based on what I've seen in um, peer, peer institutions of HGSC. And again, the ideal candidates for most EDD programs tend to be mid-career folks with a little bit of career experience um, and uh, folks who are able to apply, uh, have an understanding of how to apply some of the theory um, and some of, um, some of the research uh, directly to the work uh, as as they've sort of encountered a, a variety of successes and um, and and failures perhaps uh, within within their professional experience they sort of have a a better understanding of how realistically one can apply some of this um, learning. So I want to talk um, just a little bit about. Um, again, what you would find if you were to conduct some of this research that I mentioned earlier with regard to HGSC. So um, if you were to uh, look up our mission statement, you would find the mission to Harvard Graduate School is to prepare education leaders who will change the world by expanding opportunities and outcomes for learners everywhere. We're an institution committed to making the broadest possible impact, putting powerful ideas and evidence-based research into practice. And so when we're reading applications, this really is something that that, that is at the forefront of, of our thinking. Um, is, is this particular candidate interested in improving um, uh, opportunities and outcomes for, for learners. And in particular, um, on our admissions homepage, you'll see uh, us say, HGSE students come from a wide range of backgrounds and experiences, but hold in common a fundamental commitment to social justice and changing the world through education. That language doesn't end up there on accident, and it's not going to end up there on accident on any admissions website. So um, it does, that language is there to signal to applicants really who we're looking for and why we are uh, what what our reason for existence is in, in, in our mind. And in our um, uh, for our school, it's really to uh, make an impact within education in high need areas and to use education as a means of addressing gaps in equity and opportunity and um, uh, and uh, addressing um, and, and improving social justice. So you'll also usually be able to find um, a profile of who studies at each school. And again, this could help you better understand how you will fit and therefore articulate your fit, perhaps, uh, in your statement of purpose. Um, it could also help you understand if you even want to attend the school. Uh, this is from last year's class. These numbers have changed just a little bit, uh, but we are actually, uh, we were, we're between 40 and 50% international students every year. So we are a highly international program. We're very uh, proud of that. We have over 60 countries represented. Um, and this incoming class uh, this year among our domestic students, 51% uh, identify as people of color. Um, and then you'll see that there are about a third of uh, all of our incoming students are first generation uh, college students. So that's a number that we're very proud of. 
uh, in particular. And then um, in terms of work experience, uh, you'll see that it varies by program. Uh, for EDLD, as I mentioned, that's a mid-career program. That's about 15 years of work experience. Um, for the PhD, it's about five. Most folks tend to have a master's, but not everybody. Some folks simply have occupational research experience. Uh, and then for the online program as well, because it's a little bit of a mid-career program, 14.2 years is the average uh, years of experience. You can also get a snapshot of um, the uh, alumni profile and what kind of outcomes folks generally um, experience after graduating. And so this information is available in the links that I sent you, um, including where just a snapshot of some of the alumni uh, work uh, and some of the, the typical salaries from folks who responded uh, to our survey. And you can also find a number of alumni videos on HGSE's website where they discuss their experiences. Uh, and you can usually find that actually um, a, a lot of schools uh, put those put those out. Uh, and then finally, of course, on every school's website, you're going to find the application timeline. Um, and so please keep that in mind as you sort of assess how realistic it is to apply this cycle versus next. Uh, the PhD, the deadline is December 1st, 2023. For EDLD, it's December 15th. Um, and for our EDM, um, y'all still have some time. It's until January 5th, um, 2024. And then, of course, a list of application requirements. Um, which we'll uh, look at again in just a second. So I'm not going to go um, into them in too much depth. We also have a number of recordings that specifically address uh, application uh, requirements and um, uh, for, for our particular programs um, that, that I can refer you to. Uh, but I'd like to shift back to uh, Eliza and, and Jane um, and just get, um, get, get your take on your own experience um, applying. Um, so when you were crafting your statements of purpose, um, like what are what were some of what were some of the considerations? What were some of the challenges that that you encountered? And um, or or when you were applying in general, it doesn't have to be statement of purpose. It could be uh, you know getting letters of recommendation, etc. Uh, what what were some of the challenges that you encountered, and uh, how did you sort of work through them in order to apply? Sure. So I have always had trouble writing about myself and um, talking about my past experiences and accomplishments. So I feel like that was the hardest part of the application for me um, and just feeling comfortable with non-academic writing. And but I also feel like the Fulbright application was solid preparation for this because that was so intense and time consuming and um, required so much writing about myself. And um, I feel like that work helped me curate my past experiences and reasons for applying to the HGSE program. Um, and I guess my, with my process, I began drafting my ideas in probably October and then started to more formally write and um, organize my thoughts in November. Um, and I was intentional about not telling anyone I was applying. And I I just asked for input from one of my friends. I, I truly, I didn't even tell my family until um, I received my acceptance in March. Um, and I found that the recorded HGSC webinars or Zooms about the application process and about the specific program I was applying to were super helpful. Um, I think those are just on the YouTube page that I like, I uh, was connected to by the HGSC website. So um, those were helpful, even though I wasn't able to attend the live sessions because of work. Um, those had helpful tidbits for me to, um, to utilize in my application. Yeah. Um... So for me, like as well, it was it was really hard to just like sit down with a blank piece of paper um, and start writing. So um, when I decided I want to go to grad school, I had like a couple months. So for a couple months, I just had a note on my phone. And whenever inspiration struck me, I would write down a few sentences or ideas. So, you know, I might be lying in bed trying to fall asleep and suddenly inspiration will strike. And I like would write down a few ideas. So, and then later, like in... November, um, I started writing, like writing the actual like statement of purpose. Um, and for every school, it's very different. 
Um, so some schools like ask for like five pages of personal statement. Um, and this one, you know, was shorter. So I think I would, um, like I made one essay that was like very like statement of purpose. It was pretty long. And then from there, depending on the school, I cut it down. I added different elements depending on like the school itself. Um, so what was like really hard for me was that like, I knew I wanted to make change. I wanted to work in policy, but the point of the statement of purpose is not just to say like why you want to work in that field that you've chosen, but like how graduate school will help you accomplish that. Because otherwise somebody might read it and say like, okay, you want to do policy, just go do policy. What do you need us for? So to like write that part, like I really had to look at like the purpose of graduate school and like do research on each program that I applied to. So for like, for each school, I talked about a professor I wanted to work with, um, like a research center that was aligned to my interests at the school, um, like a class that I was really excited about taking, um, which, you know, didn't even end up being a class that I decided to take, but it's just like the ideas that you had when you were just like looking at the course catalog. Um, so like, I also like talked about like specifically the skills that I would learn in graduate school and like how those skills aligned with the work that I want to do in the future. Um, so I was like totally the opposite of Jane with telling people, like I told every single person ever that I was applying to graduate school and exactly which schools I was applying to, what programs, um, you know, like friends were like, Lair, let me look at some programs for you. Like this one looks good. So, you know, even <laughs> I, I had, um, like a lot of support with that. Um, and I like, I had some friends, like I conferred with my friends and I put my family and like had them read the essay, the statement of purpose and like, see if it aligned with the story of self, like my story of like what I wanted to convey about myself. Um, and from there, like I wrote many drafts and I like kept editing it, um, for like about a month and a half until, until it was due. Yeah. Uh, those are fantastic tips. Um, and yeah, thank you for sharing those experiences. I, I think a lot of people probably are coming from similar directions. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm definitely of the camp that I don't want anybody to know anything until, or I don't want to jinx it. Um, what is uh, like one tip that you would give uh, folks? What is, what is one suggestion as they consider whether to apply to a graduate study in education, maybe HDSC in particular? I suggest signing up with the admissions department to be connected to a current student, to have a conversation, like it, just a more candid conversation with them about their fall semester currently. Um, and just if you are making a decision to apply or trying to figure out um, which program to apply to, um, it's just helpful to have just that more informal um, informal access to a current student. Yeah. Um, I, I was, I would say something very similar. Um, I, I think it's like, you can either go through it as like, I'm going to look up programs that sound interesting and go through like programs first and then find the people or find people whose work you might want to do or something of a career you might want to emulate and see what types of graduate schools they went to and like how graduate school helped them in their career. Um, so for people I know who are doing the work that I wanted to do, I knew kind of what kind of graduate schools they applied to and or they decided to go to. Um, and then for some people I, I did like reach out, I think like LinkedIn was very helpful and just like finding random people who went, who have a career that I wanted um, and like reaching out and trying to like have those conversations um, to help, like help me decide what, how to apply to graduate school. Um, and then like after I already got into programs, it was really hard to decide. Um, so I did a lot of um, like conversations with alumni of the programs to see like how they like liked their programs and like what they thought of it and like how that school like prepared them for the work that they're currently doing. Awesome. 
Well, thank you for all that wisdom. Um, I, I, again, I really appreciate you know you sort of sharing about your your journey and and um, your thought process when applying. Um, and uh, you know, I see there's there's a bunch of you know questions coming into the Q and A. I know Jackie's answering um, some of them. Um, our our current students, if there's any questions geared towards towards them or the student experience are, are welcome to to jump in and answer as well. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, just some some tips reiterating a lot of the fantastic um, um, feedback and 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 wisdom that um, Eliza and Jane have already shared uh, with regard to how to demonstrate your fit um, and uh, just leave you with with some hopefully practical tips that, that you can take forward as you're developing your materials. So um, how to demonstrate fit. So we looked at a list of uh, HGSC application requirements um, a little bit earlier. Uh, and so one of the really uh, key things that, that I suggest is creating a checklist of what you find based on your research to be the assets that are desired by the admissions office in um, and the admissions team um, with regard to candidates, right? So in doing research, you can understand, you know, if the average years of work experience for a particular degree is 14 or 15, probably work experience is a significant asset that that um, is valued in that particular uh, application um, for that particular program, right? So just as an example, um, some assets might be like academic prep preparation, passion to impact education, uh, professional experience, just as an example. Um, and then what you can do is strategically match application materials to desired assets, right? So uh, this could mean that, um, you know, your statement of purpose, if, uh, if you are nervous that, um, your academic ability uh, might not necessarily meet whatever requirements uh, of, of the program, then that can be what you focus your statement of purpose on. If you're worried that you don't have enough professional experience, or perhaps your professional experience isn't in education and you need to really demonstrate your passion in education somewhere, then you can look at what are some of the materials where I can demonstrate this passion, right? Uh, perhaps it's in some of the short essay responses that that you can um, that you can write um, for the application. Uh, perhaps that needs to take on a disproportionate amount of your statement of purpose if that's really what you feel like your other materials don't demonstrate. But I would really look at uh, you know what is what do I need to show the admissions committee in all these other areas? And then how am I going to show it through the materials that I have? How should I focus specific materials on addressing specific um, you know, desired assets for, for a candidate? Um, because that, that's really the best way of sort of achieving the kind of balance you need um, in order to be able to um, uh, demonstrate a, a successful application. And this also will help you understand maybe who you should ask for your letters of recommendation, what areas you need them to really speak to. So with regard to letters of recommendation, we suggest choosing individuals that you know well, um, rather than folks simply with a, you know, a, a grand title. Um, letters are most effective when they feel um, really intimate, when they feel like they can discuss an applicant's uh, passions and, and desires for uh, improving the field of education, um, rather than, you know, simply sort of um, summarizing their, their work. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe limited interactions. And so we do recommend asking recommenders far in advance um, and even providing them some materials. So if you haven't had uh, contact with a recommender in a few years, perhaps providing them with an early draft of your statement of purpose could be really effective. Certainly providing them um, a resume, providing them information about the program that you're applying to, and also maybe even an understanding of what the program is seeking in its applicants. Um, but of course, letter writers, um, you cannot be involved in the drafting of your letter recommendation in any way, and recommendations to HGSE must be submitted uh, by the recommender only um, by the application deadline. Strong statements of purpose generally are in introductions to the candidate and discussing sort of what sparked the interest of the candidate in the field. They discuss passion and commitment of the candidate for the field of education. Um, they typically talk about the relevant experiences, right, and sort of trace the trajectory of relevant education experiences that folks have had throughout their lives and how they ended up at this point where they're ready to apply to graduate study. And then they talk about what their goals are for graduate study and ultimately long-term impact afterwards. Um, how can this school or program um, help you um, achieve uh, your goal? And then finally, 
Um, the PhD statements of purpose uh, typically really focus on on research, uh, and so it does all the things that the EDA, that the statement of purpose that we just discussed does. But it also focuses on your research um, ambitions, why that research is important, how that research is going to fill an important gap within education that we need to um, you know urgently um, address, and. Um, it does need to concisely state your previous work experience and in particular your research experience and how you got to this point um, in your in your career that you're ready to pursue this very significant um, dissertation uh, project. And finally, and Eliza indicated this as well, um, discuss uh, what faculty you would like to study with. That's going to be particularly critical for PhD applications. I know that we're at time um, as, it's, uh, as it's nine o'clock, but I just wanna leave you with um, a, a few things. Uh, of course, you're gonna get this presentation and um, as well, I'm gonna follow up on an email uh, in the coming days that has this presentation as a PDF. Um, and you'll also get a few additional links, including to our event recordings page, which Jane um, mentioned a little bit earlier. And of course, uh, a way to contact us at GSE admissions at harvard.edu. And the last thing I'll say is that uh, full, through our partnership with the Fulbright Association, one of the things that we do offer is application fee waivers for um, all of our programs besides for the PhD, which is co-managed with the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Um, and so folks can actually sign up um, through a form, uh, which we will send you. And um, through that form, then you can waive your application fee to our EDM or EDLD programs. You can also sign up for uh, a number of sessions that are dedicated specifically for our partners, um, which include uh, the Fulbright Association, TFA, and, and, a few, and a few other organizations. So I'll send you much more of that information in an email. Um, I am going to uh, respect everyone's time and the fact that it's nine o'clock on the East Coast, and I want to make sure that everyone is able to, um, uh, you know, leave and get on with the rest of their night. But I'm personally going to just stick around and, and answer uh, a few more questions uh, as, as they come in. Uh, but I do encourage everyone to, um, to do whatever they need to do. And I appreciate you spending the last hour with me and us. I appreciate Eliza and Jane and Jackie joining us this evening. Um, and all of you across the world for um, tuning in for the last hour. But there are uh, there are a few uh, items here in the Q and A, um, and so uh, so we've answered some of them. So is there an application fee waiver for Fulbright alumni? Uh, there there is, and we'll send you the form for that. Uh, all all registrants the form for that um, shortly. Um, Isra, um, uh, we would, we would love to participate and we'd love to talk to, um, uh, Education USA. Uh, you can reach out to me, um, at my email. Uh, I sent you an email. I'd send all participants an email before this presentation. So please just reply. And I'm happy to, to talk to you, uh, more about that. Um, thanks for the suggestion. And, uh, what are some ways we can connect with current participants, um, in HGSC programs? as well as faculty. Um, so there's actually a number of, um, of ways. So uh, Jane, you mentioned uh, one of our pathways, which is that there's a form on our website where you can be connected to current students or alumni. And we match uh, you know, three or four um, dozen um, folks every few days. So we're, we're really um, matching quite a few um, at, at this point in, in the year. And um, you're welcome to uh, sign up and we're happy to connect you with someone that may have a relevant career trajectory to yours that, that can um, shed light on um, how the coursework and the experience is helpful to them. Um, with regard to faculty, uh, you know, it's a little bit harder. Um, I, and, you know, Jane and, and, um, and Eliza, I don't want to like put words in your mouth and put you on the spot. But, um, you know, I, I think that when, when you're sort of on the outside, a lot of our faculty receive so much fan mail, so to speak, that I think sometimes it might be difficult to get through to them. I think that when you're in classes with them, they're far more accessible. Um, and so I, I want to, um, you know, both sort of excuse the, the fact that they may be hard to reach right now, but also explain that I think that's because they really reserve that time that they have for their students um, and want to be able to spend that time with them. Um,
So uh, a few more questions here. Um, do we apply to HGSC or mention a specific program within the school? Um, I suppose you mean, do you mean, if you mean for the application fee waiver, um, you'll actually, you'll mention that information um, in, in the form that, that you will submit. Um, see, there's another question. I'm applying to PhD with concentration in CIS. Is it okay? if I indicate two professors from CIS and one professor from another concentration? Absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, oftentimes uh, folks will work with uh, professors across concentrations, even though their primary advisor, you know, will, will be in the concentration that, that they are formally um, in, enrolled in. Uh, and then another question is, in the application, in the institutions attended, about courses related to your area of study, do we need to upload every course? This is really a question of, um, this is this is subjective. Um, so it really depends on uh, what you want us to see as your, as your relevant coursework. We're of course going to look over your transcript as a whole. We're not just gonna look at the, the classes that um, you sort of indicate in that space, but it, this is an opportunity for you to really highlight some classes for us that relate to education. Um, and uh, help us better understand, you know, your experience within education, perhaps your passion for education, um, you know, through the courses that you've taken in the past. Uh, so could we connect to a faculty member to discuss research areas before applying to the PhD? So you are welcome to contact faculty. You're welcome to email them. Their emails are posted online. But again, because of the number of requests that they typically get, uh, just from folks who want to talk about their research, their time is limited and they really want to protect it for their students. So um, they may reply in some cases and in others they may not. But if they don't reply, don't take it as discouragement. You know, it's it's really just um, uh, they don't have an ability to reply to everyone. However, in that link that I sent you earlier before the presentation began, um, there is a list of PhD advisors. Everyone who's listed in that page has indicated that they expect to be able to take advisees this next year. Um, I'm writing from Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, where I'm connected to various higher learning institutions. Would you be pre would you be uh, present to students at RMIT um, and Fulbright University? And again, um, please just go ahead and email me, and we can we can begin that conversation and sort of see what our um, certainly we we want to talk to anyone that we could talk to, um, and everyone that we could talk to, and um, we're we're happy to uh, discuss. Um, uh, your interest in, in, in graduate study in general or at HGSC in particular, um, you know, as long as sort of our, um, it just may need to be some time out, um, you know, simply because of our uh, staffing, but, um, but please reach out and we can get that conversation going. Um, is there any doctoral consortium that the PhD student can take courses from other institutions? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so students can take classes, um, uh, Harvard students can take classes at MIT. They can also take classes at Tufts um, and, and cross enroll. And of course, they can take classes across the Harvard University system, in particular for our PhD students in their um, uh, elective coursework. And the other part of the question is, how is the tuition and fee support for students to study um, at a destination university. So it's it's usually local universities um, as opposed to, it's, so it's not like study abroad. Um, th that That is not a feature that I'm aware that we we have as part of our, as part of our programs. Um, but there are several universities in the Boston area that folks can take classes in. Uh, if I participated in a Fulbright program and took a lot of courses in the U.S., but don't have the transcripts as I was officially an auditor, even though I participated as a regular student and received grades, how should I indicate that in the application? So in general, whenever you have issues within your application that um, you, you feel like your grades and your academic history is not going to be fairly um, conveyed, um, there's almost always going to be a section of the application where you can discuss your academic trajectory and tell the admissions committee anything else they should know about it. And I highly encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, anything that, you know, anything like odd um, or unusual gaps 
uh, in your education, you know, retaking courses, retaking, uh, restarting degrees, things like that. Uh, please tell us about it. And uh, this is yet another, rather than being a burden, this is actually another opportunity to speak to the admissions committee and give them more information. Again, um, try to explain how you have some of those assets that every admissions team is going to be looking for, right? So um, that um, that's something I, I highly recommend. Um, but I would I would explain that situation exactly as you um, sort of began to in this comment, um, and um, you know you would um, you know you would still need to show degree or uh, um, credit bearing coursework, right? So you would still need to submit transcripts as just. Uh, those particular transcripts, perhaps, um, if they were just audited classes, they weren't for credit, um, you wouldn't necessarily submit, but they could still demonstrate your interest in education. They could still demonstrate, perhaps, um, a certain skill set that you developed through auditing a class. In the PhD online application, one section asks, what other programs uh, am I applying for? What is the question for? Research, purely research. And so, um, you know, as Jackie and I uh, every year try to uh, understand, um, you know, how to, uh, how we want to go about reaching folks and, and have conversations about the opportunities at HGSC, that information is helpful to us to understand um, where else folks are looking, what else folks are considering uh, with regard to their applications. But we do not in any way consider that when evaluating your application for admission, not at all. Uh, we don't even have the bandwidth to, uh, but we take a look at that after folks are admitted in the spring when we begin to think about our recruitment operations for the next cycle. Um, let's see. Uh, taking my master's in 2015, so many years ago, What's the strategy to improve my chances? Uh, the the distance between your master's and your PhD actually um, doesn't doesn't make uh, much of a difference from from our perspective, right? So some folks have, you know, as you saw, there's folks uh, who have been out of uh, who have 35 years of professional experience, and during that time, maybe have not attended school at all. So that's not a problem at all. That that gap in in, in your in your education after your master's degree. Um, instead, it's really about discussing your career trajectory. Uh, what have you done since then? Um, you know, what is sort of the through line? Uh, what is that common thread that has led you from that point to today? What, how have you grown? What have you learned? And why are you now at a place in your career that you feel HGSC is the right um, opportunity for you in order to be able to make an impact in the field of education? Uh, can I apply for the spring? Unfortunately, we only do fall admission. Let's see here. I think we're mostly through these questions, y'all. Um, there is application fee waiver for Fulbright alum. We've discussed that. Um, as far as I know, Fulbright scholarships is not for PhD for people who are situated outside the, the US. Um, Alicia, did you wanna say something? I see, um, Alicia, that you may have um, written that you'd like to answer that, but, and I don't know the answer to that. I'm not, I'm not so sure about. Can you repeat the question, Stan? Yeah, so the question is, as far as I know, <clears throat> um, Fulbright scholarships uh, are not for PhD for people who are situated outside the US. Isn't that the case? Um, it can be for a PhD. Is that so the question? Yeah, it could be for a PhD. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it can, it's usually, it's often for a master's or a PhD. It just depends on the, the Fulbright um, commission country and the receiving institution. Okay. Um, the, the, 
the st thank you for that. The stipend uh, for a PhD does technically cover the summer months, but again, it it's not um, it you know it it sort of uh, most applicants find that it doesn't necessarily cover anything above a very 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 modest uh, means of living. So oftentimes there's additional financial support that folks feel they need to just to be more financially comfortable. But it does sort of cover the basics. Um, it's generally a little bit more than thirty thousand dollars a year. Um, is what the stipend is for the for the PhD. Um, Jackie's answering about the minimum TOEFL score. Um, uh, does bachelor degree GPA considered more important than master's degree GPA? My master's is three point nine five, but my bachelor's is two point eight. Um, is it's not really that one is considered more important than another. It's more that. Um, uh, it, it's more just that sort of like an explanation of of your overall growth and narrative. I mean, the fact is, look, if you if you finish your bachelor's ten years ago, you're probably a very different person today than you were ten years ago. And we're going to be judging you based on what you accomplished over the last ten years more than we're going to be judging you based on your bachelor's program. And there's absolutely folks who are in our program with GPAs of two point eight in their bachelor's, and you know, in some cases, much lower. So um, it's not um, it's it's really not uh, essential. Um, I, I wouldn't worry so much about the GPA itself as well as as much as sort of explaining your overall trajectory, your growth, and again, how you got to this point in your um, in, in your career. And I think we're almost done here. So uh, what are some ways we can connect with current participants? Uh, we, we discussed that. And then the last question I see here, the last one I think we'll take today and then let everybody get on with their nights. Um, is I have a master's degree in um, bilingual didactics and language uh, teacher. I started uh, my doctorate in sciences of education from Spanish universities since last year in March. We have done 12 UC and I can't cont continue since this past September because I didn't validate two UC. Uh, what can I do in this case? I am not quite sure what a UC is. I, is, that, is, that, is that Fulbright? Um, terminology or? I don't think so. Um, maybe, maybe that person can, if you can just put something else in the chat to define what UC is. I'm thinking it's like an undergraduate credit, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, so, I mean, generally, um, you know, it it's not, um, you don't need to have completed your, do your doctorate. Uh, you know, you, a lot of folks start doctorates, don't necessarily complete them. There's a space where you're asked to explain uh, why you didn't complete a doctorate or why you left the program. Um, you can discuss that in the application, but um, if you didn't complete your credits, that shouldn't um, that shouldn't be an issue from from our perspective. Um, um, you, and so, uh, and then this is sort of like the, the sort of last uh, final question here. The the SOP suggestions that I offered earlier. Uh, do do we have to follow a specific order that I mentioned? And no, you don't. As long as the order is logical, as long as you talk about your research, as long as you talk about your career objectives, why you're trying to pursue the research that you are and what you hope to achieve with it, um, that's perfectly fine. It doesn't have to follow a formula at all. Um, but that is just sort of the one I mentioned and the one I'll send you in the PowerPoint, that's sort of a common one. Um, and... Um, and uh, unfortunately, with our program in particular, you will need to, um, if, if you don't have a bachelor's degree from the U.S. and you're not a native speaker, um, or the institution that you completed abroad um, didn't have a sole language of instruction as English, we will need total scores um, as well, unfortunately. Um, so thank you all for, um, thank you all for joining us today and sticking around for, for so long. And um and asking all these great questions. Uh, it was it was great to hear from all of you. Um, you all have my email. Please reach out if you have any questions. You'll get another email from me with some additional information, including um, our slides um, in, in the coming days. But um, I wish you well in the application process if um, you are about to embark on it. 
Um, and I hope our paths cross again. Until then, please have a wonderful rest of your night or morning um, or whatever it is, um, wherever you may find yourself. Thanks so much, Dan, and thanks to the, uh, the Harvard Graduate School of Education for doing this session, and thanks for all our attendees for, for watching. Uh, a recording of this will be available later, but have a great night. Thanks.